Don't be alarmed. I may not be a Jew, but I'm Jew-ish. I, I, you know, I grew up in a little town in Pennsylvania in Amish country. Now you can imagine that there probably weren't a lot of Jews in Amish country, Pennsylvania. In fact, there was one family, the Cronenfelds, who had the furriers. I decided, knowing that they owned the furriers, that they were probably the people I should find out something about. <laughs> it wasn't until I went to college that I actually met a Jewish boy, and until it was Easter break, and he invited me home to meet his family, and then his mother said I couldn't come. And I said, why? And he said, religion. And I said, what's the problem? I'm Christian, and he said, I'm not. And I said, well, what are you? And he said, I'm a Jew, and I said, what's that? And he said, it's too hard to explain. And I said, but don't you love God? And he said, yeah, and I said, so? I didn't go for Easter. As I got older, I started to learn a lot about religion. Well, frankly, I started to learn about religion when I was 10 and told my father I did not want to go to their incredibly boring uh, <laughs> Pres Presbyterian church where all the songs were and all the people were. And he said, well, what would you do? And I said, I wanted to go explore some other religions. Because with my father, if I wanted to do anything, I had to explain why, which I now have come to understand is very Jewish. So I went to all the other churches in my town, which were Baptist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, and Catholic. But no, not anything else. So by the time I got a little older, I started thinking, there's got to be more than this. And I started looking into other religions and other people. And it became very, very interesting to me, just the look at theology and the way that different people get their God. And I came to learn a lot about faith and what that means. And I really did like the way that Jews got their faith and the intellectualism coupled with that, the study. And when I moved to New York when I was 19, I found that all my friends seemed to be Jewish. And the people that I was more and more attracted to seemed to be Jewish. And as I started to study more and started to travel more, I started thinking about that in many ways there was a center of spiritualism was really in the Middle East. And this started to inspire me very deeply as I read all kinds of things from all kinds of different spiritual people and all of these people's different beliefs and all of their different understandings and all of the different ways that they looked at compassion and generosity and family and home. And I started thinking about all of these wars, the wars that have gone on all over the world for centuries, Roman wars. I mean, we're Irish. And let me tell you, the Irish did not have it great. And I come from, my mother was a third generation Irish maid. My mother was given away when she was nine years old to become a live-in maid at a dentist's house where the office was in the house. That was my mother's life until she married my father when she was 16 years old and he was 17 and they tried to whittle out a life together. Now, when you're poor and you live in Pennsylvania, in this kind of small, backwoods, hillbilly environment. There's not a lot of respect. There's not a lot of care. And nobody really thinks you can be anything. And there's a lot of prejudice. There's a lot of prejudice. 
when you're really pretty much white trash, when you're poor, really poor. And we were poor. And then my dad really, you know, he made it. He was a tool and die man. He made $14,000 a year and supported four kids and we were rich. We were rich. We had a beautiful farmhouse and my mother put a garden in, an acre garden and it was beautiful and she canned those vegetables in the fall and my father hunted and he was a great hunter, so great that he stopped using a gun and he used a bow and arrow because he felt it was more fair. And we ate the deer that he got in the winter and the trout that he and my brothers fished for and the rabbit in the summer and the spring with those vegetables that my mother grew and canned in the summer. And that's how we lived. That is how we lived. And I, I am to this day very, very proud of that. But I will tell you that as my education grew and my travels grew and I began to read and I read more and more, and even when I was a young girl, I read so much because I believe that education is the foundation of all things and decency and hard work. And I feel, I think about things in Jewish history, but I don't only think of all of the sad things and all of the losses and all of the heartache. I think of that ship, the Exodus. I think of that ship bringing people who had just broken dreams and it made it made it. And would those people have been in Israel? Would their families be here now? Would some of you be here now who had ancestors on that boat? Would I be here? The daughter of a third generation Irish maid. Would I be here if we didn't accept? If we didn't accept because that is a foundational reality, acceptance. I always had this secret dream. I was a girl with a lot of secret dreams, let me tell you. My sister got the front half of the closet for her clothes. I got the back half of the closet for my pillow, my books, and my flashlight. I had a lot of dreams. And I have had such unbelievable, I have been beshared. I've seen and touched the world. And I always thought in my quiet secret place, if I could do anything, anything at all, I'd like to help work on peace in the Middle East. But how does a little shiksa from Meadville, Pennsylvania, work on peace in the Middle East. How do I do any of these big things I dream of? If I said any of them out loud, everyone made fun of me. I couldn't tell them I wanted to be a movie star. I couldn't tell them I wanted to even leave town. No one left town. Hell, no one got a divorce. Some people died. They drowned in the river, there was accidental shootings, <laughs> but there were no divorces where I grew up. <laughs> so, I had to carry my dreams very quietly, and I'm sure you understand that. Because where there is repression, where there is fear, you must carry your dreams quietly. But I did. And eventually, after many years, ultimately I spent 22 years as the global, eventually, campaign chairman of the American Foundation of AIDS Research. And thank you. 
and thank you. Because now we have life curing, life extending drugs where if you develop AIDS, you can live a long and healthy life. So thank you. Thank you. And because of you, I've retired from the AMFAR. <laughs> well, because of you and Harvey. <laughs> um, but more importantly, I was invited to go to Davos, to the World Economic Forum. And I went to Davos as an expert, but I happened to go the year of the tsunami in, in, in Asia. And they asked me to come and speak with the um, amb ambassador of uh, health and welfare from the United States to help the first responders who were coming back because we could deal with death and tragedy and we knew what to do more than anyone else. Imagine. And we got through it and we did well. And we helped those people develop a budget to go back to my main important thing that I think I gave was to tell them, don't bring religion, do not take missionaries. Allow these people to keep their religion, to keep their artifacts, this will get them through. Do not take their religion away. Get the town elders together, they need their religion and they need to bury their dead. And we worked through a lot of these kinds of things because, believe me, the first responders were as devastated as the people who were there. So afterwards, I got this crazy idea that I should raise some money for bed nets. And everybody thought I was nuts, and we raised a lot of money, and we sent bed nets into Africa. Then people came to me and said, what would you like to do? And for the first time, this little hidden dream I had I said, I'd like to work on peace in the Middle East. And they sent me to meet all the representatives who were there from Israel. I felt like an asshole. <laughs> what the hell did I know? I had a dream. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I said my dream, and I went home. A couple of months later, I was walking down the hall at MGM with my agent. The phone rang. He goes, yep, yep, yep. Sharon? Yeah. Shimon Perez would like to invite you to Israel. Would you like to go? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to go. I'd love to go. You're going to have to leave at least a week and a half early for your tour of casino. Do you really want to go? It's going to be a long time away from home. Yes, 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 I want to go. I want to go. I want to go. And I went to Israel. I don't know if you can imagine <laughs> what this meant to me. I know not everyone in this room is going to have the same political points of view, but that was a great human being. I loved that man. And he was so good to me. He taught me so much. And he gave me basic assignments. First assignment, speak to women's economic group from Palestine and Israel together. Okay, I did that. Second assignment, teach an acting class to adults of Palestinians and Israelis. Can you do that? Yes. Actually, tougher because everybody's emotions have to come out in this wild way all over the place. That went okay. Next, we're going to work with children. We're going to raise some money. We're going to meet all these children. And we're going to figure out how to help them, get them the education that they need. We're going to do that. We started doing that. Next, every time I was with him, we did more. I learned more. We developed more. I came to understand more about Israel. I came to understand more about what was needed. And he would tell me, 
Sharon. You're like a young Bill Clinton. I didn't know if that was good or bad. I said, Shimon, if you were five minutes younger, I'd proposition you. We, we worked together on many things. And eventually, he introduced me to Yuri Sevier. If you don't know Yuri, Yuri wrote the SALT treaties, for which they won the Nobel Peace Prize. Yuri's a brilliant, brilliant, extraordinary human being, one of the greatest minds I've ever met, and one of my dearest friends. And God bless him, say his name in prayer, if you would, because he's not well right now. And he's a very, very special person who's done great things many, many times for Israel. So, Shimon said, Yuri and I want to create an online peace movement. I said, okay. I said, Israeli, Palestine, what do you have in mind? What's your whole idea? No, no, bigger. Can it include Ireland? Sure, why not? Okay, we started YALA, an online peace movement. We now have over a million young people online, all over the world, connecting, discussing peace. Not just discussing peace, but saving each other's lives. What do I ask them to do? Show your house to each other. Get on FaceTime. Show them your mom. Show each other your kitchen. Show each other what you're eating. Go outside your house. Show each other your street. Show them your dog. Show them your room. Show them your life. Let them hear your music. It's not so scary if you see what each other's life is really like. It's not that far away, and maybe you won't be enemies anymore. Then it started to grow and grow and grow. Then we might have a kid trapped in a building who is being shot at by machine gun fire everywhere and can't get out. He goes online, the other Yala kids around start figuring out where is he and how do we get him out? And they save each other's lives. It's been a miracle. It has been a mitzvah. I'm so proud of this movement. And we got financing from the State Department. And we had financing until this particular situation that we have in the government to now. John Kerry was our senator that represented us and helped us, but we do not have financing now from the American government. So I'm asking you if you would like to look online at YALA, and if you like to see peace, peace in Israel, peace in the Middle East, just look at what we're doing. I got my friend Eileen Getty from the famed Getty family to participate with me, and we started citizen journalism. The Washington Post, the New York Times, mag newspapers from all over, the most prestigious newspapers have had their people working and teaching classes online with our million students, teaching them citizen journalism. Because as I said, it is not just faith, but faith in intellectualism, faith and belief in communication, and the way we behave with compassion, dignity, and integrity that will change the world. This, for me, is what truth is. Truth is showing who you are, showing it to one another, and showing it with grace, kindness, decency, and compassion, Yala. Thank you.